I want to kind of do what the White House does now, where they come in after the speaker and do a bunch of damage control. So I thought I would do that for Pastor Forsberg and all his politically incorrect speech tonight, talking about how people in Brookings are ugly, babies are ugly, you're ugly. It's a, it's a tough thing to hear. Um, and then, you know, I mean, he kept describing me, perfect height, perfect physique, perfect looks. I, I, so I wasn't one of the victims, but I'm sorry for all of the rest of you. Just want to apologize for that. And, and uh, we're not all like that, amen. First Samuel chapter 10. I appreciate those prayer minutes. They're always a challenge and, and uh, enjoy them. We're uh, <clears throat> talking about Saul. Saul is God's choice for Israel's first king. This was already known for Samuel and Saul now, but the people still have a decision to make, and that's what we're going to talk about tonight, the decision. Uh, they demanded a king against God's will, and God then giving them what they demanded, <coughs> which doesn't always happen, but as uh, Psalms said, and we'll read the verse in a little bit, he, he gave them their desire, but he sent leanness to their souls. Sometimes we, God says, okay, you want what you want, you think you want, you can have it, and then we suffer the consequences. Uh, but here, so he did choose the king he wanted them to have uh, since they demanded one, and now it's up to their choice that they're going to listen to God's choice. It's still going to be up to them because uh, they've already demonstrated they're going against God. Now, had they rejected Saul for another person, that would be doubly rejecting God, really, asking for a king and then not taking the one that he brought to them. So uh, Samuel calls an assembly of the Israelites to the town of Mizpah. Uh, this town is significant in Samuel's history. Uh, the Bible talks about several towns that he used as his hubs or uh, his headquarters. This was one of them. We see that in 1 Samuel 7:16. Uh, it was also central in location to Israel. So he calls this meeting. And tonight we're going to look at this meeting. I think we can learn some things to be a blessing uh, to us in our lives as well. Let's start reading verse number 17 of chapter 10. <clears throat> and Samuel called the people together unto the, Lord at Miz unto the Lord at Mizpah, and he said unto the children of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt, and delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of all kingdoms, and of them that oppressed you. And you have this day rejected your God, who himself saved you out of all your adversaries and your tribulations. And you have said unto him, Nay, but set a king over us. Now therefore present yourselves <coughs> before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. And when Samuel had caused all the tribes of Israel to come near, the tribe of Benjamin was taken. And when he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come near by their families, the family of Mitri was, Maitri was taken. And the Saul of the son of Kish was taken. When they sought him, he could not be found. I'll read more, more in just a few minutes. But let's start with that. Father, I pray, bless the reading of your word tonight. Help us to learn from it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So before the decision, we see a little preaching before the decision by Samuel. Uh, before he was, uh, Saul was presented to the Israelites, Samuel took to the pulpit, so to speak. And he gave them a little bit of the truth. He reviewed their blessings in verse 18. Uh, he he viewed the, reviewed the great blessings of God to Israel. And can I say, whenever we have a significant decision to make, we always ought to review God's blessings to us, what God's done for us in the past, reminding us of His goodness. Gratitude to God ought always be a major factor in our decision-making and that motivates our actions. And then he reviews not only Israel's blessings, but he rebukes their, uh, th their choices. In verse 19, he said, you have this day rejected your God. He's just reminding them, by the way, we're, we're going to bring a king in front of you, but that's because you rejected God as your leader. Remember, the form of government they were, government they were under was a theocracy, and now they were demanding a monarchy. What kind of crazy people in their right mind would go from a monarchy, or from a theocracy to a monarchy? Probably people like ones that would go from a republic to a socialist, but you know, we can go beyond that. Uh, people do crazy things. So they despise God. The word rejected there means to abhor, to despise, and reject something. Uh, Israel's attitude towards God was terrible. They should have revered and embraced uh, their, their difference and their uniqueness, but they loathed and rejected it. How sad it is when people do that, but we do the same thing today uh, when we want to be like the world. What an insult that is to God. 1 Peter 2.9, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a uh, holy nation, a peculiar people. I remember when I read that as a teenager, I thought, yeah, even the Bible calls us weirdos. Church people are weird. Well, that's not what that word means. Peculiar means set apart, means special. 
You are not like the world. You are better. You are special. You're my people. You're set apart that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness. We ought to be grateful to be his people. What an insult and a slap in his face then it is when we say we want to imitate what he saved us from. He saved us from a life of sin. He saves us from the world. He saves us from sin and death. And we want to imitate it and want to be like it. Of course, it's an insult. And, and uh, Samuel was very offended by it for, on God's behalf. And so then he said they uh, despised God. They also disregarded their blessings. Who himself saved you out of all your adversaries. These people were filled with ingratitude. They ignored the tremendous blessings of God that when he had delivered them out of Egypt, he had split the Red Sea for him. He'd got water out of a rock. He had rained peanut butter pie or manna, whatever you want to call it, out of heaven uh, to feed the people and uh, did all these things to them. And ingratitude to God will always corrupt your decisions, always. William Jordan said, Ingrati Ingratitude is a crime more despicable than revenge, which is only returning evil for evil, while ingratitude returns evil for good catch that revenge is not even as bad as ingratitude revenge is only doing something evil to somebody who done evil to you ingratitude is doing something evil to somebody who did good to you ingratitude is a terrible attitude to have they desired a king you have said unto him nay but set a king over us so samuel rebukes their desire for a king here god did not want to have them to have a king as of yet anyway but they wanted it uh and they didn't care whether god opposed it or not so now let's look at the process in the decision. Verse 19, I'm not going to read it all. We're kind of short on time. But uh, as we read there, when it talks about uh, the tribe of Benjamin, he had caused the tribe of Benjamin to come nearby their families. The uh, tribe of Benjamin was taken in verse 20. Then the family of Metri was taken. Matri was taken in verse 21. What that's talking about is lots. So Samuel used the same uh, form to pick a king as Joshua used to find out who was guilty when Achan was exposed. They used lots. So they started with the children of Israelites and the tribe of Benjamin. So then they cast lots in the tribe of Benjamin and the family matron was taken. And then they cast lots in the family matron to all the way down to Saul. This was what was happening. The Uman and Thurman, you read, Thuman, you read that in the Old Testament, was probably used with the high priest. So Samuel knew that God had chosen Saul but he's demonstrating this to the people so everyone can see that God has put his choice on Saul. Now understand this process is not going to make the decision. The people will still decide whether or not they'll take what God has given them. It's only to make known God's choice to them. The process was public confirmation of Saul, what had already been revealed in private to Samuel and Saul. I think that's an interesting thing because a public confirmation will always happen for those truly called by God. You don't have to promote yourself. You don't have to get on Twitter and brag yourself up like um, Pastor Forsberg's Hollywood heroes evidently do. Uh, you know, we, we don't have to constantly promote ourselves. Let God promote you, amen? Uh, just, uh, if you're truly called by God, he'll, he'll magnify you. I like what the Bible says about Joshua. Joshua for years was faithful steward of Moses. He helped him. Uh, he was his assistant, did everything he was supposed to do. Then Moses passes off the scene. Joshua is put in charge. And the Bible says that God magnified Joshua to the people. You know what magnifying does? It makes bigger what's already there. It doesn't change anything. It just makes it bigger. And so God took the character that Joshua had and made it visible to all the people. He'll do that for you too. Let's not promote ourselves. Let's just let God do that. Uh, so God will bring you to the front when the time is ready. If God has called you, he'll elevate you when the time is right. So Psalm 106.15, the verse I just referred to, and he gave them their request but sent leanness to their soul. The this, this selection that's made in Saul, understand, is not that God thinks he's going to be a wonderful king. It's because he's giving the people what they deserve here. In Saul, he is giving them a man after their own hearts. They were a corrupt people, and they are getting a corrupt king. They don't understand it, of course, at this time, because their hearts are blinded by their desires, which happens whenever we depart God and start going after the things of the world. But God, in his judgment, gives the people what they want. When they reject divine rule, they're going to get defiled rule. I could say that ten times. If we, whenever we reject 
divine rule. We're going to get a defiled rule. Now, people have a tendency to vote and desire after their own kind. Why do we have wicked leaders in the world today? Because there's wicked people voting wicked leaders in, in place. And so uh, th that's why it's so foolish for these people to demand a king in the first place. By the way, again, I don't want to go into rabbit trails because there's not much meat on rabbits, but Romans chapter 1. If you read Romans chapter 1, you'll find the very worst thing God can do for you. You know what that is? Give you exactly what you want. Read the chapter sometime. That's the worst thing God can do for us is give you what you want. That's the worst thing you can do for your toddler kids and as young kids when they're growing up. Give them everything they want. That'd be a horrible kid by the time they get older. Amen? Uh, so when we demand what we want and God gives it, sometimes it's, it's almost like, a, like judgment in doing that. All right, moving on. Look at uh, verse 21. After the selection process, uh, they, the, they said that he could not be found here. Saul had hid himself among the stuff. Saul's hiding gives the appearance of humility. In fact, many people even refer to this as Saul being humble, but I think it was probably more of a false humility. It, it, it's, it's true that he would feel probably a sense of unworthiness or inadequacy to do the task, but I think it's more likely that he's shirking his task here. He's already been told what he's supposed to do. <clears throat> he's been given his duty, and he's hiding among the stuff. And I look at that, and I think of all the Christians today and who, instead of doing what we should be doing, hide among our stuff, whether it's toys, whether it's busyness, whether it's hobbies, whether it's whatever. Instead of being faithful to church, instead of being faithful in our Bible reading, instead of being faithful doing what God tells us to do, we're hiding among our stuff. And that stuff can take many forms. But let's not be guilty of that and hiding from our duty. Um, verse, verse 22. Therefore they inquired of the Lord further, if any man should yet come hither. And the Lord answered, Behold, he hath hid himself among the stuff. <laughs> you might hide from people. You're not going to hide from God. He knows where he's at. Oh, yeah, he's hiding over there. Uh, you know, playing hide and seek with God is a really bad idea because he's going to know where you are. Uh, there's gonna, you're not going to be successful in that game. So <clears throat> he quickly reveals that. Now all this showed the people's desperation to see what God, to do what God had forbidden, which is to have a king. Can you imagine if they searched for God's approval and they searched for God as desperately as they searched for this king they shouldn't have had in the first place? They'd have been a lot better off, wouldn't they? But that's what we do in our life too. We get our eyes on something, good or bad for us, a lot of times bad, worldly, and we go after it, we insist on it, we, do, we sacrifice good things in our life for it, and we become ravenous for something that we shouldn't have in the first place. People who reject God become very enthused in their own ways. All right, verse 23 through 24. He was higher than any of the people from his shoulders and upward. And Samuel said to all the people, See ye whom the Lord hath chosen, there is none like him among all the people. This is a great lesson God's giving them. They're following their fleshly desires. They are trusting, they're, they're looking to uh, appease their <coughs> worldly desires. And what better than to give them somebody tall and good looking? And he fits the bill for them. Uh, the, the next tallest person came to his shoulders. So he was a very tall uh, man. He made a great specimen. The people of Israel were attracted to Saul because of his height. They had their eyes fixed on the outward, not on the inward. Later they get David, who was just a shepherd boy, but inwardly he was what God wanted. Okay? Saul looked good on the outside. He was rotten on the inside, or would be soon. Uh, so we always ought to go toward that. We, they learned the hard way that size was no substitute for wisdom and spirituality. In fact, that might, I might make that my life's theme. Size and height is no substitute for wisdom and spirituality. Kind of like that. Uh, Saul's size did not make him a good king. Uh, got him a lot of votes, but it didn't make him a good king. And we, we, we would do well if we look at character instead of somebody who looks good and sounds good. Uh, because that can be a sinking of us. Now, I want just a little trivia here. Again, jumping off the main track, but it, compare the two Sauls in the Bible. It's interesting. Uh, the, if, if you look at their outward appearance and their inward character, both King Saul and the Apostle Paul, Saul, uh, before he became the Apostle Paul, 
in the New Testament, both of them were from the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, but that's about the only way the two were alike. King Saul was handsome, and tall, and looked good on the outside. 1 Samuel 9, 2 talks about that. The Apostle Paul was just the opposite. In fact, uh, first, uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 10 says that his bodily appearance is weak. He, he did not make a good specimen. He was, uh, uh, he looked more like, no, let's not go there. Uh, I don't want to fall into the trap that was set earlier here. Uh, the, the Saul of the New Testament was not impressive outwardly, but he had character inwardly. The Saul of the Old Testament was very impressive outwardly, full of rotten dead man's bones on the inside. Which one are you? What do you seek after? you seek after that which just looks good? Or you seek after what's right? Do you seek to live the kind of life that just looks good on the outside? Or do you try to live a true God-pleasing life on the inside as well? We know which is more important. Look at verse 24. All the people shouted and said, God save the king. This shouting was voicing the decision of the people. They heartily approved what they, they saw. And they did, they had enthusiasm in it. They, the shouting for Saul is a sad revelation of their carnal hearts. I got to think, while that's going on, Samuel's sitting over here. I just I try to picture his, his face in my mind today. What's he thinking? How, he, he was heartbroken. We know he was just heartbroken that they are choosing this route. And he knew, he had told them how this is going to be a disaster for you. And it was. But that's what they demanded. They ought to have been shouting for Samuel. He's the one that, he was the greatest blessing in Israel, not Saul. But see, that's what happens. Uh, uh, no one stood no one stood above his shoulders, spiritually speaking. All right, Samuel was, was their uh, God's man for them. But Israel wasn't looking for spiritual heroes. People rarely are. They're looking for uh, heroes that look good. They want their heroes to be impressive in the flesh. And it reveals our empty, wicked hearts when we go after fleshly heroes instead of uh, heroes of men. I, I encourage that with my kids, and I encourage those of you who have children, give them godly heroes. We, we, let, we let them have sports heroes that we wouldn't let in our home without hiding our stuff, you know what I'm saying? We let them make them heroes of them. We need to be careful. Who our heroes are expose our hearts. It exposes our hearts. McLaren said, there is no surer test of individual character than the sort of heroes that people worship. Athletes and soldiers still captivate the crowd, and a mere prophet like Samuel has no chance beside the man of broad shoulders and well-developed biceps. Sadly, that's true. We see the physical, and we get all excited about it <coughs> rather than uh, looking at the heart. Churches are even guilty of this uh, sometimes, exalting worldly stars or exalting worldly things rather than the spiritual to attract a crowd or for whatever reason. Uh, we don't want to do that. We want to build character. We want to build people on the inside. The old preachers and missionaries uh, of God that have been serving God for decades, they don't have as much of an appeal as the young and fresh and fancy do sometimes. And yet that's who God honors. I heard a story uh, years ago, Henry C. Morrison. He was a missionary to Africa and he served the Lord there for over 40 years he was on the field in Africa and uh, finally they had the age and, and health was bothering so they had to come back home to the U.S. and, and uh, this was before the days when people came home every few years and could fly and all that they were still going ships so you didn't come home sometimes for decades you didn't sometimes never they were coming home after decades of being gone and and uh, he was talking to his wife he says I wonder if anybody will remember us wonder if anybody will meet us at the boat. Unbeknownst to him, to Henry and his wife, on that same boat was Teddy Roosevelt, President of the United States, uh, and he had gone to Africa for a hunting trip. He was also on his way home. So when the ship pulled into New York Harbor there, uh, Henry Morrison looks out the window, and lo and behold, he sees bands, and people, and banners, and people are cheering. Whew, he said, what, how an exciting thing. Uh, he told his wife they, had, they did remember. Uh, th so they, uh, being thrilled with all that, quickly gathered their things, and when they got to the deck of the ship, there wasn't anybody there anymore. Found out that the president was there, and he had already gone, and they had come to welcome President Roosevelt. So he got a little bit discouraged. 
as you can imagine. And uh, he told his wife, I don't get it. For 40 years, we have served the Lord faithfully, faithfully in Africa, poured our life into ministry and service, and we come to America, we come back home, and there's not a single soul to welcome us home. His wife sat down next to him, put her hand on his shoulder and said, Henry, you've forgotten something. We aren't home yet. Amen? It's a good way to look at it. We aren't home yet. When we get home, there'll be that welcome. There'll be that honor. Uh, let that be a comfort to you. Whatever happens in this life, your reward is not here. It's in heaven. And uh, remember, you're not home yet. All right. Let's conclude this out. After the shouting quieted down, Samuel spoke to the people. Look at verse 25. Then Samuel told the people the matter of the kingdom and wrote it in a book. What's that? That's called the Constitution, basically. For lack of a better word, that's what we'll use. He gave them a Constitution. This is how your government is going to work now. Uh, <coughs> the manner of the kingdom. This, the, it's an uh, explanation of how things would be. It's not easy for people to change the form of government. But Samuel, so I think he was very wise in, in informing them the manner of the kingdom. And then going on, it says, and Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his own house. And the people have now affirmed Saul as their king. Everything's going to change now. Everything's going to be different. Not better, they think. They got what they wanted. Israel is an example, like Samson, where they got what they wanted and lost what they had. You ever done that in your life? Demanded something and you got what you wanted, but you lost something so much better. I think people that step out on marriages and do things like that, that they find that to be true sometimes. They, they think they want something to go after it, and then they find they lost something so much better than what life offers now. So uh, this, was, this is going to change here. Samuel had to go home with a heavy heart. Uh, nothing more to be done. Israel's wish is granted. They had a king. There was no turning back, so he dismissed the meeting and sent them home. I just want to make one more note, verse 27, but the children of Belial said, how shall this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no presents, but he held his peace. One of the few wise things Saul did, held his peace. <laughs> Some people you don't argue with, okay? Especially not children of Belial. Now, the <coughs> we can't say, well, these must have been godly men because they rejected. That's not what's going on here. Sons of Belial are never mentioned in the Bible as a good thing, or children of Belial. And so uh, it, it's always used to depict people of worthless character. The reaction was rebellion against God, and they would not accept God's choice. And, and true, God's choice for Saul was the punishment on Israel, basically. But that's not the issue here. The issue here was this is who God said is going to be, and they're rejecting him. The issue is the general principle of submitting to God's will, and they refuse to do it. But I want you to see something here as we close and just give you this contrast as a warning. By the way, Sunday night, I encourage you to be here Sunday night. We're going to talk about uh, teamwork makes the dream work in a church. And I, I, I've just been working on it today and it's, it's kind of exciting to me. But um, this is kind of along that line here. Look at the difference between verse 26 and verse 27. Verse 26, And Saul also went home to Gibeah, and there went with him a band of men whose hearts God had touched. And then... Verse 27, but the children of Belial said, how shall this man save us? And they despised him and brought him no presents. Whenever you have in your life, in a church, family, whenever you have the blessing of verse 26, you'll have the curse of verse 27. Always happens. Whenever God's working, there's good things happening, hearts are being touched, lives are being changed you're always going to have Satan entering in as well. You're, you cannot have verse 26 in your life. We cannot have verse 26 in our church without also experiencing verse 27. There's always sons of Belial. Satan steps in if he can. So whenever God blesses you with a band of men whose hearts God had touched, you can count up, you can count on it that there will arise the children of Belial. Whenever a work is moving forward, expect opposition. Whenever good things are happening, expect something. And, and not that I say live negatively. I praise God for where our church is right now. I really do. We were sitting, we went to a ministry heart conference a few days ago, uh, Pastor Nick and I, and we, we were sitting around in the evening with the speakers. There's just a select few of us. And, and uh, so 
the uh, main speaker was kind of just just talking, talking different things. And so he asked, what's the biggest challenge in your church right now? And we were going around, and of course, you know, different pastors, you know, they're trying to kill me. Uh, you know, uh, you know th- whatever reasons and things they had going on at that time. And I was thinking there, I mean, God's really good right now. Oh, God's always good. Don't, I didn't mean to say it that way. Things are really good right now, amen? I mean, things are going forward. There doesn't seem to be any schisms where uh, the spirit is great and, and uh, the preaching is phenomenal. And, you know, all those things, these good things are happening. And uh, praise the Lord for that. Hey, but friends, listen, it's not always going to be that way. It's not. As long as we're going to baptize another little girl Sunday, as long as people are getting saved, as long as people are getting baptized, as long as people are growing, we're going to see resistance. It's just going to happen. I, I don't relish it. I certainly don't want to live negatively or uh, be, be cynical in anything. But it's just the fact of the matter. When you have a verse 26, you're going to have a verse 27. So it's best for us to not... Uh, I don't ever want to be that person that, yeah, well, you might say it's good, but bad times... Are... We're not going to be like that at all. But let's not... Uh, that, that's why I think the Bible says, be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil walketh about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So yeah, let's not... You know, we don't have to look sideways at people or look at where the trouble's coming from. We don't do that at all. But keep an eye out because Satan's around. He wants to, he wants to throw a schism. He would like nothing better than make you hate you and you hate you. And, and this, uh, I went to a church one time where the two sides were full and the middle was almost empty. And I found out later this, these were warring factions going on, you know. Uh, terrible. Satan loves that stuff. Loves it. Let's beware of it. Devil's always at work. And so let us uh, seek to do the right thing in our life at all times. Truly so. Amen. Thank you, Father, for loving us. Thank you for the great place you give us here at Bible Baptist. I pray you'd help us to continue.